Okay, great, great. Holy is the Lord. Wow, that's a, that's a beautiful song. That's a beautiful song. Our text for today is taken from 2 Corinthians, uh, the 13th chapter, verses uh, 11 through 14. And the title of the sermon is, Be Fully Restored in Your Lord for One Another. Be Fully Restored in Your Love for One Another. Now, this text today, 2 Corinthians 13, 11 through 14, is probably, I think, since I've been speaking, probably one of the shortest texts that I've ever had. It's, it's basically four verses. Of course, following the lectionary and it's select, uh, uh, giving us maybe various texts that we can select from, I chose this one, but I don't think I've ever chosen a, a text with such few verses. But at the same time, it's probably one of the, 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 uh, the texts that I've had to research the most. Um, well, I had to go into detail just to fully understand uh, what Paul was getting at in this uh, lesson uh, or in his message, this letter to the, the Corinthian church. Let's uh, read that and then let's get into it. Uh, Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 11 through 14. Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restitution. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, all this research didn't have to go into kissing. I'm being facetious here. Uh, but it says very little about that, but it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Father, as we delve into your word, we just pray that we will understand more and more what this restitution is that the uh, Corinthian church had to go through. And Father, we must be restored in you. And we must be restored to that love that we have for one another. Not that it's died, but we should be closely watching it, that we build on that concern and love and help for one another on a regular basis. So thank you. We pray that as we go through this, you will open up our understanding and that we will uh, fellowship with one another even more closely. We thank you and we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, <clears throat> the church at Corinth at the time of Paul's writing was, was weak. Uh, I'm going to just quote to you a little history here uh, in the beginning of uh, 2 Corinthians in my Bible, where it talks about the letters that Paul has, has sent now to the Corinthian church. It says, Paul has already written three letters to the Corinthians. Two are now lost. So um, Paul evidently sent four letters to the Corinthian church. We only have one, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. It goes on to say, in 1st Corinthians, the second of these letters, he used strong words to correct and teach. So Paul sent four letters to the Corinthians. Somehow two of them were lost. But we have obviously the second letter that he wrote and the fourth letter that he wrote. The first and the third letters were somehow lost down through history. But it says the church at Corinthian was weak surrounded by idolatry and immorality, they struggled with their Christian faith and lifestyle. Through a personal business and letters, Paul tried to instruct them in the faith, resolve their conflicts, and solve some of their problems. First Corinthians was sent to deal with specific moral issues in the church and to answer questions about sex, marriage, 
and tender consciences. That letter confronted the issues directed and was well received by most. But uh, these were, but there were false teachers who denied Paul's authority and slandered him. Then Paul wrote 2 Corinthians to defend his position and to denounce those who were twisting the truth. 2 Corinthians, and this is the, the book that we're in today, 2 Corinthians must have been a difficult letter for Paul to write because he had to list his credentials as an apostle. Paul was reluctant to do so as a humble servant of Christ, but he knew it was necessary. Paul also knew that most of the believers in Corinth had taken uh, his previous words to heart and were beginning to mature in their faith. He affirmed their commitment to Christ. Next, Paul next turns to the issue of collecting money for the poor Christians in Jerusalem. He tells them how others had given and he urged them to show their love in a tangible way as well, as well. Paul then gives a strong defense of his authority as a genuine apostle while pointing out the deceptive influences of the false apostles. As we read this intense personal letter, listen to Paul's words of love and exhortation. So that's somewhat of a, of a background uh, to, to this second chapter of Corinthians. Uh, <clears throat> Paul challenged these brethren in Corinthians. Uh, he loved to be perfect or complete. He wanted them to be comfortable and comforted and assured that God cared about them despite all their problems. They needed to be of one mind, thinking, believing, and speaking in agreement. In his earlier letter, Paul wrote, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That's 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now here in this letter, Paul, uh, now here in this last letter, uh, they still needed to live in peace, dwell together in harmony, respect one another, and encourage one another. And you know, that's the same for us today. These are things that we need to, to practice as a fellowship. Paul was dealing with an ongoing problem in the Corinthian church. He could have refused to communicate until they cleared up their situation, but he loved them and reached out to them again in this second letter with the love of Christ. Love, however, means that sometimes you must confront those we care about. Both authority and personal concern are needed in dealing with people who are ruining, them, ruining their lives with sin. Now, there are several wrong approaches in confronting these people, and we must pray to God for the right approach. Paul sought to build relationships by taking a godly approach, sharing, communicating, and caring. Notice that this approach is a difficult approach that can drain you emotionally. That is the one carrying the message. It can drain you when you take this approach emotionally, but it is the best way to approach uh, the other person. And it is the only Christ-like way to deal with the sins of others, sharing with them, communicating with them, and showing care as we approach them. Now, in summary, there are three areas that Paul wanted this Corinthian church to work on. I'm going to list these six areas, and then we'll look at them more closely. 
Number one, he wanted them to break completely away from all false idols or from all idols. Number two, a warm hospitality to be shown to the three delegates. Number three, uh, a generous and prompt contribution to the Jerusalem Relief Fund. Number four, a changed attitude toward he himself. Number five, to agree with the Lord. Number, number six, to live in peace without divided loyalties. Let's take a look more closely at these things that he wanted them to work on as a church. Number one, to break completely away from all idols. We're in uh, chapter 13. Let's go back to chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 15. It says, What harmony is there between Christ and uh, Belial? Or what does a believer have in common, common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? Well, we know there's no agreement between God and an idol. For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out of them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing or no unclean principle and I will receive you, and I will be your, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So some of them were still kind of hanging on and had ties to idols. Paul says, we need to get rid of those. Number two, be warm or a warm hospitality to be shown to the three delegates. Go to chapter eight. We were in chapter six. Go to chapter eight, starting in verse 16. It says, thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we are sending along uh, with him a brother. So there was Titus, and then they said, we are sending along with him a brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, we have chosen, he was chosen by the churches to be accompanied, to accompany us as we carry the offerings which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. So not only was there it was Titus, but there was this other brother who, brother who had received praises from all the churches. Very upstanding person, a person that they all liked, a person that they could trust. Verse 20, we want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. So he was helping in this offering that they were, they were uh, taking up. Uh, he's a person who could be trusted. Verse 20 again, we want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift, for we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. 22. In addition, we are sending with them a brother, another man, who uh, has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous, and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. For as uh, Titus, he is uh, my partner and co-worker among you. As for our brothers, these other two men, they are representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you. 
so that the churches can see it. So there were three men. Paul wanted them to show hospitality to, to welcome these men. They are there to help you. The third thing was a generous and prompt contribution to the Jerusalem Relief Fund. Go to chapter eight, we're in chapter eight, look at the first seven verses. Now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of every severe trials, I'm sorry, verse two, in the midst of a very serious trial, the Macedonians were going through a very serious trial at that time. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. So even though they were going through this trial, they were still overwhelming in their generosity. Verse three, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They uh, urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring unto completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, Paul is buttering him up, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I need you to support these, uh, these brethren who are in need. There's a dire need. So just like the Macedonians, I want you to support them. Number four, a changed attitude toward he himself. You have to realize this was Corinth. There were a lot of uh, false apostles there. And they were weighing Paul against these false apostles. And Paul wanted them to have a change in attitude toward him. Chapter 10. Still in 2 Corinthians, chapter 10, starting in verse 1. By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold toward you went away. And that was Paul's personality. He, he, was, he was kind of a... a, a a person who was, had self-restraint. He didn't boast about himself. He says, I was timid when I came face to face with you. He said, but bold toward you went away. Verse two, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be toward some people who think that uh, we live by the standards of the world. Now, he said, don't push me too much because I'll get tough. Verse 3. For though we live in, in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish uh, arguments and every... Um, pretension that uh, sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. He says, if you're not obedient, I will bring it to your attention. I will bring it to your attention. So he says, uh, have a changed attitude toward me because I'm leading you in the right way. And then in chapter 11, Paul talks about 
himself being compared with false prophets and how indeed he was a, uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He talks also in chapter 11 about, um, he boasts about his sufferings and all the trials and the tribulations that he had gone through for the sake of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 12, he talks about the thorn in the flesh. He prayed to God to remove the thorn in the flesh, but God said no. God was keeping him humble and allowing him to deal with that. Also in chapter 12, his concern for the church at Corinth. So Paul says, please change your attitude toward me. I'm not fighting you, but I'm only presenting to you what God has given me to give to you. And please, Understand there's a difference between what I'm teaching and what the false apostles are teaching. Number five, to agree with the Lord. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 10. He says, um, Chapter 10, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from, and I think that's Chloe, it's pronounced, from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you say, I follow Paul. Another say, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still others, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? There are many things that people could be divided over if they let uh, that spirit of factionality be there. And Paul says, don't be divided. Uh, he says, agree in the Lord. And brother, there's many things that we can disagree with. I mean, there's the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Some say yes, some say no. There's a day of worship. There's one, pitting one pastor against another. Paul says, there is no place for that in the congregation. Learn to agree, get together, study, pray that God will give you unity. That's what he's getting across to them. And number six, to live in peace without divided loyalties. Back to second. Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 through 6. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I may present you as a pure virgin in him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. You accept that stuff. Somebody is coming to you with different doctrines. Verse 5, I do not think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do not, but I do have knowledge. <coughs> we have uh, made it uh, this uh, clear, uh, perfectly clear to you in every way. So Paul took time over and over and over to explain where he was coming from with the gospel of Jesus. But 
those people in the core church, they were kind of on the fence, going one way, going the other, one way, and then the other. He says, we've made it perfectly clear. He said, I might not be the best speaker, but I do have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then chapter 12, verse 20. For I am afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as uh, you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, uh, arrogance, and disorder. I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of uh, the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. So we see that even in this second letter to them that the Corinthian church, of the Corinthian church, they were still not out of the woods yet. Back to our text, 2 Corinthians 13. Look at verse 14. May the God, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Wow. Paul is invoking the fullness of God's provision on behalf of our Corinthian brethren here with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Get this, the distinctive personality of each is bestowed upon them. This is denoted by the threefold operation of the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the communion or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. He's invoking all of these upon the Corinthian church and asking that they come to their rescue. No, the Corinthian church was familiar with the teachings of the doctrine of the Trinity. And Paul is saying, I'm calling upon all these forces to be with you and to help you. Verse 12. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Obviously, the early church regarded the holy kiss as a common form of salutation, just like they do now, even today, in some of the Jewish uh, countries. This was a special sacred uh, significance. This was a sign of greeting during biblical times. It was much like the modern day handshake. It was expressed, it expressed brotherly love and unity. It expressed union and fellowship within the church. It also possibly was a sign of mutual forgiveness and reconciliation one to another. And Paul, encourage them to continue that tradition. Paul frequently called and referred to our Corinthian brethren as saints. Second Corinthians 1.1 1, 1 says, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Now, the King James Version used the word saints. Interesting note here. They occupied that position of saints because they were sanctified, separated from sin, and dedicated to God. This happened the moment of their 
conversion, doing though some were vile sinners an instant before. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts 2. Some of you might know where I'm going. Acts 2. Acts 2, verse, verses 37 through 39. When the people heard this, now this was during Pentecost. So we all remember when God sent his spirit down upon his people in general during Pentecost. When the people heard this, they were cut to their hearts and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what? shall we do? Verse 38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is to you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Repent and be baptized. And then verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, tell me where it says that Peter read them the riot act and all this stuff and told all 3,000 people what they needed to do, and are you doing this and are you doing that? I bring that to your attention because, and I'm going to repeat what I had started, the people at Corinth, all called them saints, they occupied that position of saints because they were sanctified, separated from sin, and dedicated to God. This happened the moment of their conversion, though some were still vile sinners an instant before. In the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul took note of the before and after scene in the lives of many of them. The list of sins of which he wrote included fornication, idolatry, homosexuality, thievery, and drunkenness. Then he remarked, and such were some of you, but ye are washed but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians 6, verse 7 through 11. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you mean you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong and do, do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do, you, do not be deceived, neither the uh, sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor uh, greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you are, were washed you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So there's special first forces at work with us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are made righteous. They had those problems in Corinth, yet Paul did not want the Corinthians to lose sight of their unity with the other churches. 
Our t- text today was Paul's closing words to the Corinthian church. When these qualities are overlooked, these wrong qualities, there is a problem that must be dealt with. These trials do not come to the church by glossing over problems, conflicts, and difficulties. They are not produced by neglect, denial, withdrawal, or bitterness. They are the byproducts of the extremely hard work of solving these problems. Just as Paul and the Corinthians had to hammer out difficulties to bring peace, So we today must apply the principles of God's word and not just hear them. Are we applying God's principles in our lives every day? One last scripture here. Our text is 2 Corinthians 13. Jump to verse 5. Verses 5 through 10. Paul tells them, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do not you realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Unless you give up, Jesus is in you. Don't give up. And I trust that you, verse 6, and I trust that you will discover that you will not, that you have not failed the test. You are still trying. Spiritually, you are still conscientious. Verse 7. Now we pray that God, that we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong, not so that the people will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak. Paul is saying we're glad, he is glad whenever he is authoritatively weak when approaching his people, but you are strong. I'm glad when I'm weak with my correction because you are strong. And our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up and not tearing you down. Now, if you aim for these things, Paul is saying, then the God of love and peace will be with you. That was Paul's love for them. That was Paul's encouragement for them. In that very last letter to the church at Corinth, Paul wanted them to be fully restored in the principles they had already been taught. Thank you, brethren, for that message. And now we want to transition into communion. And my wife has given me a a message here to stop the recording.